in the last class we have seen that electrical quantities and mechanical quantities can be equivalenced and let us start by just recapitulating where we were. We saw that in mechanical domain the basic coordinate is position uh, or displacement for from some uh, datum position. and its electrical equivalent would be charge. The rate of change of position is velocity. So, velocity is equivalent to the rate of change of charge which is current. Okay. Then, uh, acceleration is rate of change of current d i d t. Hmm. Force is equivalent to electromagnetic force. Uh, what else? Mass is equivalent to inductance in the sense that mass has the property of resisting change in its inertial status, inductance has the property of resisting any change in current. Hmm. Uh, then you have spring constant k that is equivalent to 1 by c, 1 upon capacitance. Good. The damping constant or frictional coefficient is equivalent to resistance. Finally, the two, two things I forgot to uh, talk about in the last class. In mechanical domain, there are two types of energy, the kinetic energy and the potential energy. Hmm. So, let us see what they are equivalent to. The kinetic energy is how much? Half m v square, half m m is proportional to m is equivalent to l v is proportional to i so half l i square it becomes equivalent to what is half l i square the energy stored in the in the inductor huh? so kinetic energy is equivalent to the energy So, if in any circuit there are three inductors, the kinetic, kinetic energy or equivalent of the kinetic energy in that circuit would be the total energy stored in the three inductors. Uh, potential energy then would be equivalent to the energy stored in the capacitors. So, this sort of completes the story of the equivalences. Uh, it is not easy or uh, common sense to see that the energy stored in the inductor is actually has the property of a kinetic energy and the energy stored in the capacitor has the property of potential energy, hmm? but you should know that. That was essential content of the first class, last day's class. So, let us start off from there. We say that the, the Newton's method can be written simply as force is equal to mass into acceleration. So, we will write it as the mass into acceleration in the left hand side because that is the derivative part. So, m 
q double dot is the mass into acceleration is equal to equal to what whatever the force is. Now, this force we said has two components one something that is impressed from outside either it can be some externally applied force or it can be a force applied by the other elements of the system. For example, if it is sliding against something two bodies sliding against each other then one body experiences a force applied by the other body which is also part of the system. For that body that this, this force will this frictional force will have to be included. If this body is connected to another body by means of a spring then because of the spring it the other body pulls with some force. So, that is also included here. So, all these forces are to be included. So, so this has to include the externally applied forces, it has to include the forces between elements which are connected by springs, forces between elements which are connected or interacting with, uh, uh, with the help of frictional elements also and which is crucial the constant forces. Hmm. So, let us just recapitulate what we said about the constant forces. Most of the motions of bodies are constant in some way hmm. as we showed the, the, the uh, example that if you have a pendulum like this then its bob is constrained to move on the surface of a sphere right and that happens because the constant applies a force on the body. Hmm. So, this force then has to be included. If you have a surface like this and you release some kind of a body here and it slides down, why does it follow this particular equation? Because it is acted on by a force that is the constant force. So, when you write the Newtonian equation then this constant forces have to be included clear. That is why the Newtonian equation will have to be written as plus F C these are the constant forces. And if you have n number of such bodies for each body then it will have to be written with a subscript right. For each body you will have an equation like this for all the n bodies you will have equations like that clear. Now, we need to say a few more things about the constraints. Constraints can be of a few different kinds. See these constraints let us how can we mathematically express the character of these constraints. What kind of constraint is this? Here uh, we can express the constant as some kind of a function, some kind of a algebraic equation this one can we not. So, it was originally a three dimensional space and we can then express a equation which will uh, which will restrict it to a lower dimensional space clear. So, that requires one equation to be written what is the form of that equation? it will normally be of this form some kind of a f of if there are many such uh, uh, variables. So, you will write x 1, x 2, x 3 and so on so forth equal to 0. Okay. In this case the, the position is, is given by x 1, x 2, x 3 and a specific equation relating this x 1, x 2, x 3 equal to 0 gives the constant equation right. In general uh, this might also be this function might also be dependent on time. You might imagine that this uh, is being moved. You might imagine that this is being moved. So, in general this might also contain time. Now, any constraint that can be expressed in this form is known as holonomic constraint. Remember this word.
is called holonomic constant. Some holonomic constants do not need this term t that is it is independent of time like this and some holonomic constants will need additionally this concept of time the dependence on time, hmm. but both are holonomic constants. You can easily see that the holonomic constants actually reduce the dimensionality of the system. right? For example, here the bob is constrained to move on the surface of the sphere and therefore, we can as we will see we can define a new coordinate system on the surface of the sphere and that is actually what we do. For a pendulum it will be stupid to write in terms of x, y, z. It will be far more logical to write in terms of theta and phi spherical coordinate system. Why? Because what we are actually doing, me, doing is that we are writing in terms of a lesser smaller number of coordinates constrained to the constant surface remember that. Okay. So, holonomic constants are actually our advantage. Hmm? Holonomic constants are our advantage. We will have to learn how to take advantage of that in a systematic way. In case of the, the pendulum just by looking at it by applying our common sense we saw that okay, no, 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 we do not need to use x, y, z, we can better use theta phi, but that is observation. There has to be some kind of a systematic way of going about it, that is what we will learn. But let us, a natural question is can there be a non holonomic constant, a constant, but non holonomic nature? Yes, that there can be something that cannot be expressed in this form. Imagine in your hostel, do you play carom? Huh? The the bodies are constrained because they have to be re, have to remain within that boundary. But can you express their equation by means of like this? No. Still, it is a constraint. That kind of a constraint, which is expressible as an inequality, not equality. Here is an equality, right? But a body constrained to move within the the the, the boundaries of the carom board is given by a inequality. This point, that point, this point let it be 0, that point let it be L. So, x coordinate is constrained within 0 and L, it is inequality, right. That is a non-holonomic constraint. Billiard is a non-holonomic constraint. If you have a container and molecules moving within that, they are constrained by a non-holonomic constraint because they have to be within that. And even uh, very simple situations can give rise to non holonomic constraints. The, imagine a uh, very interesting example. Suppose you have got a line and some body uh, that can move on this line and there is another body that can move on this line. Hmm. One dimensional problem not a difficult thing at all. Hmm. So, it is the q coordinate hmm, uh, of this body and that body and they are free to move. Are their motions constrained by anything? Yes, of course, they cannot occupy the same position. Huh? Their bodies, they cannot occupy the same position. Now, imagine uh, if I plot their, their uh, okay. what will be the configuration space in this case? Configuration space, we introduced that concept in the last class. The minimum number of coordinates, position coordinates that you need in order to express the complete positional status of the system. The system contains two bodies, so you need two position coordinates and the configuration space will be then q 1 and q 2, q 1 is the position of this one and q 2 is the position of that one from something. Okay. And then in this q 1, q 2 space, these bodies will just move around, huh? their motion that means in the q 1, q 2 space, uh, the motion of these two will be given by some kind of a trajectory. Okay. Notice, I am not talking about the trajectory of this one given by some, some 
orbit and relative to that one given by another. I am talking about then in the configuration space, the the total positional status of the system consisting of these two bodies given by a point, a point. Okay. Now that point can move around like this, which would then mean, supposing it is here, which would then mean that the position of this fellow Q1 is here minus something and position of that fellow Q2 is plus something. Okay. So, this is a configuration point, this is a configuration point, is it, is it clear that here we are not talking about individual positions, but their collective position, the position coordinate of the whole thing represented graphically in the configuration space. Now notice, this line then becomes a forbidden line. This line means what? Q1 and Q2 are the same, 45 degree line. Q1 and Q2 are the same means that is a forbidden uh, state, they cannot take the same position, which means that in the configuration space, this configuration point can either wander in this side or in this side, but cannot cross, right? So it can go like this, no problem, fine, but it cannot cross because crossing would mean that the at some point of time the two occupy the same position. That means within the configuration space then the configuration the point is then constraint. What kind of constraint is that? It is the inequality constraint. It cannot take this value either it is here or here. So it is also a non-holonomic constraint. Okay. So, the non holonomic constraints as you can see that does not reduce the system dimension, hmm. holonomic constraints do and fortunately most of the engineering systems have some kind of holonomic constraint. So, it will be more important for us to understand or to be utilize the advantages of holonomic constraints. So, let us pay some more attention to that. First, in case of the simple pendulum. Uh, if you express in terms of x, y, z, uh, what is the holonomic constraint equation? Hmm? It is constraint to lie on the on the sphere. How does it expressed as? It will be x one square plus x two square plus x three square is equal to l square. Huh? Assuming this to be the origin, it will be trivial to move the origin to this point because that will be a uh, simple first step that anybody would do. So, this minus L square is equal to 0. I am expressing at some function of x s equal to 0 in this form. Okay. Now, suppose this point is moved as a function of time, then what? Then, then also at every position Supposing it is here, then, then also from that position it will be a surface of a sphere. Again it moves here and from that position it will be a surface of a sphere. So, essentially what is happening is that this, uh, if it is moved like this, then also it is a constraint, but what kind of constraint can we express that? This is the x direction suppose. In that case you will say that is x 1 plus that function of time this square plus x 2 square plus x 3 square minus L square is equal to 0. That will be the constant equation. Notice that this is expressed as f x j comma t equal to 0. Sorry, this is expressed not as this huh? and this is expressed as f x j comma t is equal to 0. Hmm. 
uh, actually they have some names you will find in uh, textbooks that this has a name that has a name uh, this name is scleronomic constant and this name is do not be scared by the names. I will not shoot you if you forget these names, hmm. but still why am I writing it? Because in books if you come across these words, you should know what they are. Hmm. They are not fruits hanging in the trees that you can pluck and eat, they are specific names or specific types of constants, you should know that is all. Hmm. So, if you come across these words, you should be able to say that these are specific types of constants, but if you forget if this type what is the name okay there is no problem about it huh? because everybody cannot remember everything i know so these terms were coined these are you know coming from latin and still these are these are the terms used so i'll go by assuming that you'll forget these names hmm? and i'll not take that as a big scene whatever it is the point is these are the names when you come across them in the textbooks you should know what they are so, we have seen that there are two types of constants in the main holonomic constants and non holonomic constants. Holonomic constants offer the advantage that you can, if you are clever enough, uh, reduce the system dimension. In case of non holonomic constants, you cannot do that. So, if you have non holonomic constants, you are forced to use the old set of coordinates for each body, three coordinates x, y, z. Hmm. So, normally you would if there are three bodies then how many coordinates will be there nine coordinates if it is constrained by a non holonomic constant you will have to use all the nine coordinates but if there is one holonomic constant then the system dimension reduces by one if there are two holonomic constants the system dimension reduces by two if there are three holonomic constants so it goes on reducing imagine here you have here you have the equation as as this right that is one equation that makes the dimension one less from 3 to 2 but imagine that if it is a planar pendulum then there is one more constant equation that is say y is equal to 0 hmm, or x2 equal to 0 so x2 is equal to 0 is what is a constant equation then it is also in this form x2 is equal to 0. Geometrically what are you doing? Here this equation one constant equation uh, defines some kind of a subspace. The second constant equation defines another subspace and then the ultimate constant is what? The intersection between the two. Okay. Since it is the intersection between the two then the system dimension reduces uh, by the number of holonomic constants. Okay. So, the system dimension reduces by a number of holonomic constants and that obviously is a major advantage. Now, the point is that in the classical Newtonian method, there is no systematic way of utilizing this advantage. Hmm. Uh, let me illustrate by by doing it for the simple pendulum, if you write the equation for the simple pendulum by the Newtonian way, x, y, z, huh? do it, write the equation, you have the simple pendulum, hmm. uh, here we will take the theta here there will be a tension working T, huh? here there will be m g working fine. So, x coordinate, y coordinate and z coordinate clear. If we draw the free body diagram, the way as shown uh, the d alembers way, then we will have to do two three body, di three body diagrams 
along the x coordinate along the y coordinate. <coughs> along the x coordinate what will be the, the equation? In this direction what is the pull? Theta is here T sin theta, T sin theta that will be counterbalanced by mass into acceleration in that direction m x double dot right. So, that is the free body diagram in the x direction. In the y direction here is a pull working that is t cos theta. So, t cos theta hmm? in this direction m g right. So, you have the m g minus t cos theta working and naturally there will be a component of the acceleration mass into acceleration m y double dot that will be the free body diagram simply equate you have the, the equations given. So, uh, m d 2 x d t 2 is equal to t sin theta m d 2 y d t 2 is equal to m g minus t cos theta and and z direction m d 2 z d t 2 is equal to 0 there is nothing working in that direction. So, the Newtonian set of equations are like this. Okay. How many equations did you need? 3. How many coordinates did you need? 3. And also t becomes included in the equations. Do you know how, how much t is? You do not know really. And as it swings, the t varies all the time. Huh? So, here is something that is very difficult to know, but it has gone into the formulation. So, that is the problem of the Newtonian method that the, the constant force gets into the formulation. And in case of a, of a situation like this, will you be able to write down what the constant force is? Very difficult. Huh? So, it was re realized soon after Newton that something has to be done about the constant forces. We cannot write down the equations properly or you can really solve the equations if the constant force get, it, get into the uh, system equations. That is one difficulty. Second difficulty is that if you have um, say many bodies interacting by means of something like uh, so this is a frictional element or the another spring element so like this then all these I mutual interactions have to be considered on this body not only the, the force due to gravity but also all these forces have to be considered and their vectors huh? Can you see, even if the, the system is so simple, only three bodies with this, writing down the differential equations would be mess, because all these have to be written in vectorial terms. All these will have di different directions and then the Newton's equation itself will be, will be a vectorial equation, huh? will be tough. And I am sure if I give you this problem in an exam, you will fail. Hmm? That is why we need to do something about these forces. What are these forces? Out of this, there was a problem with this one. Out of this, there was also a problem with this one, because these are all vector forces. Okay. Something needs to be done to that. Something needs to be done to simplify that. And thirdly, the Newtonian technique does not offer any direct way of reducing the system dimension. These three were recognized as uh, major practical difficulties with the direct application of the Newton's method. True, Newton gave the basic idea of writing the differential equation and after we had the Newtonian approach, that is when we started 
uh, being able to solve the equation for the mass for example, it was possible to write down a differential equation for the motion of the mass, calculate the initial condition, solve it and then predict where it will, it will be, it actually was there. So, all these major advantages came because of the Newton's laws, but these were the practical difficulties. We ultimately need to write down the differential equations. So, the within a, within a hundred years after Newton, the solution of these practical problems came hmm? and they are very valuable when we try to write down the differential equations for engineering systems. Hmm? So, let us try to learn how these practical difficulties were overcome. Uh, that will need a bit of foray into mathematics, so do not get scared about that. Hmm? Most of you are more or less conversant with maths, huh? in fact at home with maths I would say, so do not uh, get scared about that. So, let us recognize the first problem. The first problem was that there were constant forces that were troublesome. Hmm? Here we, we, we had to write down the equations using the constant forces and that is a mess. If there are many constant forces, then it will be even more mess. Uh, about a century after uh, Newton, people like Lagrange, D'Alembert, Hamilton, they produced this technique, they noticed that there is a speciality of the, the constant forces, they do no work, have you noticed? The constant force is in this direction and this fellow is moving in this direction, perpendicular direction and the constant force is doing no work. So, instead of writing the equations in terms of forces, if I write the equations in terms of the, the work done, we are through we can straight away get rid of the constant forces, can't we? Hmm. So, the next stage was to write down the equations in terms of the work, work done by the constant forces would be 0. Hmm. Now, that gave rise to a very uh, uh, solid way of writing down the equations, but let us first start with the Newton's laws uh, by rewriting the Newton's laws the Newton's equation would be m uh, for each mass point from a coordinate system, every mass, mass point will have a r, right, a vector, hmm? another vector and r, so r 1, r 2, third mass point r 3 and all that. Hmm. So, for each one m j r j double dot this r is a vector. Hmm. Uh, how do I normally in print we mark that by a uh, bold face, but let us put a small arrow overhead hmm, to mean that it is a vector is equal to f j which is a vector plus f c j. For each mass point we will have equations like this and then we can add them up to obtain equations of this form. I will I will put this one uh, here to keep the right hand side only with the constant force so that we can eliminate that later. We will write it as uh, add them up all the equations. So, sigma j is equal to 1 to say n, n number of bodies, m j r double dot j, hmm, this term minus this minus f j, this is equal to the total number of constant forces added together. So, that is the Newton's law, right and we are now trying to get rid of this guy. Hmm. Uh, we have just mentioned 
that the the constant force no, does no work is it always true i'll come back to this imagine this situation Where is the constant force? The tension in the pulley. Hmm? Does it do no work? No, it does. For this one, if it mo moves by Q amount, then it does work. And the, on this fall also, it does work. But then, overall, taking the system into consideration, they cancel off. Can you see that? So, it is not always true that the, the constant force does not do any work, but overall, it will sum up to 0 and that is why we needed to, to sum up. Hmm. We did the sum because of that. We need to get rid of the constant forces. So, the constant force in some situations may do some work, but ultimately when summed over all the bodies in the system that gives 0. That is one situation. Um, suppose a body is sliding down a surface, the constant force is acting like that, right. It is always sliding down a in a direction that is orthogonal to the constant surface, constant force and therefore, you are happy that there is no uh, work done by it. But suppose there is friction, then, then the constant force will not act in the orthogonal direction, but rather it will uh, act in a that kind of a direction, right. In that case what? You might argue that now the constant force is doing work, yes and that is why in such situations we will break up the constant force into a component orthogonal and a component in the direction of the motion and the one in the direction of motion is caused by the friction, okay and we will include it in in this term because it is caused by friction, it is not really a constant force. The constant force is the one that is orthogonal to it and it does no work, clear. So, even if this body is applying a force on this body which is in that direction, we will break it up into the constant force part and the non-constant force part and the non-constant force part, the one that is due to friction will be included as the in the given forces Fg, okay. So, we are still happy constant force is doing no work. Uh, there are situations for example, where is that yep. like this, it is being moved. Is it now true that the constant force is not doing any work? Imagine carefully, here the, the point of suspension is being moved like this and the fellow is is it always true that the fellow is moving in a direction that is orthogonal to the uh, to, to, to the string? Might not be. Then what? Then what? Then that is the the mathematical nicety that Lagrange thought of. He said that at any specific position of my uh, uh, point of suspension at any po uh, uh, specific position, this bob has some admissible motion. That means, if it is like this, it is only it can only move in that direction which is orthogonal. That is the orthogonal. Uh, that, that is the admissible motion, admissible displacement. So, in a given position, this bob always knows, always has a specific admissible direction, admissible motion. So, even if it actually motion moves in a, in, a, in a direction that is not or, always orthogonal, but it has a specific admissible motion and that admissible motion always is orthogonal at every point of time is orthogonal to the uh, constant force. So, he said okay, uh, take a camera and freeze it. If you freeze it at every point of time you will see that individual at every point of time the const the admissible motion is orthogonal to the constant okay so take free shot at every moment of time th that is happening so when we talk of this kind of admissible motion that means at every point what is the direction it could move 
that is admissible motion. Whether it does move or not, that is a different issue, but it could move in that direction. And that is uh, something that is called admissible displacement. In some books, you will find the word virtual displacement, but virtual often uh, gives rise to some confusion among the students. So, I prefer to use the term admissible displacement. So, what is the, the, the uh, technical meaning? That at any specific point of time, given a specific constant, what is the possible direction of its motion? Hmm? So, that is the admissible motion, admissible displacement and that is given by the symbol delta. So, if r is the position coordinate, then delta r is its admissible motion for the jth body delta r j. Hmm? So, this is No, mm, yes, but admissible motion is related to instantaneous position. Hmm. So, if the, this fellow is moving, the bob is also moving, that is okay. Huh. But then freeze it at any point of time, here is a string and therefore, this, this is the direction of the, uh, uh, for, of, the, of the constant force. In this position, in which direction can the ball move? Ball can always move in orthogonal direction. Yes. Yes, that's not the actual case, but at every point of time, that is true. Hmm? Every point of time, if you freeze it, it can only move in that direction. Again, at some other point of time, let it move. Again, freeze it. It is here, but it can only move in the direction that is orthogonal to the uh, the direction of the string. But with respect to the previous uh, position of the yes, ball, it is moved. Yes. Yes, it is moved. True. That is why it is a conceptual nicety, it is not, not immediately feasible. He says that at every point of time, take time instants separately, freeze the shot, uh, then look at the bob, look at the string and say which direction could it move. Then you will find that at that moment, it can only move in the direction that is orthogonal. Uh, so, even though it is not moving in the orthogonal direction, from this conceptual nicety, you see that at every moment of time, individual taken moment by moment, it is always moving in the direction that is optimal. Hmm? So, that means this delta r j has to be taken at every instant of time and that is not same for this instant and that instant, it is different. Okay. Where was it? Here. So, we were here from the Newton's equation. In order to talk in terms of the uh, work done, what you have to do? You have to, this is a force, that is a force, just multiply by the admissible displacement, that is the work. So, multiply both sides by the admissible displacement, what you get is times this is the admissible displacement hmm, is equal to oh oh quite older no no this is delta rj huh? So, you are multiplying it by just the delta r j, which is the admissible displacement. Here is the force, here is the displacement and therefore, this term is work. This term is also work, but the right hand side is 0, because here we have got, we have multiplied the, for the r th body, the constant force times the admissible displacement, that is always 0. So, this in the right hand side is 0. We have we have completely got rid of the constant force. 
from the formulation. Okay. You might argue that we still have a troublesome quantity here. You have got rid of this, but we have brought in this admissible displacement. Let's we have to do something about it. Yes, we'll do something about it. Hmm, sure. But then we have we have been able to get rid of the more troublesome fellow, hmm, and then we'll do something about this. Okay. Now, uh, do we have time? Yes, another ten minutes. So let's get to the next conceptual step. Keep this equation written in your in your copy. This left hand side equal to zero. That's what we have arrived. Sir, is there any any case uh, where we are giving additional portion of only j when we multiply? No, we have added up for 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 each one. It is zero. N number of zeros added up gives zero. Is outside the multiplication. Yes. Huh. So for each one, it is zero. And for n number of zeros added together, you get zero. So in the right hand side, you have zero. Hmm. But then remember, it was a it was a conceptual quantity. It is something that is not actual motion. Remember, this is not actual motion. This is the virtual, or in books you will find uh, virtual displacement. I prefer to call it admissible displacement. You will find in some books also admissible displacement. So at every point of time, this is the admissible displacement. Now, what was the next problem? The next problem was that uh, holonomic constraints offered you an advantage that you can reduce the number of equations. But there was no systematic direct way of doing that when it comes to the uh, Newton's laws. So we needed to something, do something about it. Now, if say normally the configuration space will be some n size n dimensional, but in order to facilitate our you know visual uh, concept, let us draw a three dimensional cons configuration space. And the configure cons the uh, constant equation gives what a surface in this. Uh, three dimension space clear it will give a surface for example the uh, the motion of the pendulum gave a spherical surface on which it had to move similarly for a different situation it will be different but always it will be a surface because a surface is what has the n minus 1 dimension hmm. so it will be a surface suppose it is a surface like like this can you see a surface like this there is no reason to for it to be a straight surface or something like that hmm. but then the motion in the configuration space is always con constant to the surface therefore the next conceptual step is to define a new coordinate system in this con uh, uh, this this smaller surface smaller dimension surface what will it look like it will look like will say on this let this be the origin and let this be one coordinate and let that be the other coordinate hmm? and then supposing the actual position is somewhere here actual position somewhere here we will say fine since this actual position is always on this constant surface we can resolve it into components in these directions and therefore it has this much of this new coordinate and that much of this new coordinate that is that defines the position clear so we are now taking the next conceptual step of going from one set of coordinates to another set of coordinates in a smaller number of coordinates okay clear so initially you had the x1 x2 x3 coordinates but now we are going into a smaller number of coordinates let that be called q1 q2 q3 fine so the number of q's would be uh, that many less than the number of x's as the number of holonomic constraints 
we have established that. So, we are going from the x coordinate system to the q coordinate system. Fine. And that would be given by some kind of a transformation equation where the x k can be expressed as functions of q 1 sorry q 2 q 3 to q n and possibly also time. So, that is the coordinate transformation equation. Imagine that in case of a uh, equation like this, in the in the in this case, the new set of coordinates q's are the theta and phi, because that uniquely specifies the position on the constant surface. Original set of coordinates was x1, x2, x3, x, y, z. Huh? Now, here we are trying to express x1 in terms of theta and phi, x2 in terms of theta and phi, x3 in terms of theta and phi and that is what I have written here. In general, it will be expressible in this form, right. And since each of the bodies are given by some kind of a r coordinate r, we have we, have, we were writing things in terms of r, the radial vector. So, this will be twice n times, but we can simplify it by writing n equations r, huh? r 1 will be then a similar function of q 1, q 2, q n t. Similarly, r 2 the position of the second body will be and 2 r n nth body I want understood what we are doing. So, each body was given in the old coordinate system by an r. Now, this r is expressed in terms of the new coordinate system q 1, q 2, q 3 and maybe it, it can, can also be a function of time. If it is a holonomic constant, the, the, the surface is also time variable, then it will be a function of time. So, in general, I have written like that, but that might be a bit difficult to conceptualize. So, you might say that okay, R1 is expressed as a function of the new coordinates q1, q2, q3, and q1. Okay. Then we have we have this equation. In general, in short, we can write r j is equal to r j q i comma t simple short expression of what we have written, written here. The jth radius vector radial vector from the origin to the jth mass point is expressed in terms of the new coordinate system and time. Okay. If that is so, then how do you express r dot j? Because r dot j was representing the velocity, we need to co convert the velocities also. So, r dot j will be d r j d t, then it has to be written as a chain rule. Hmm. As a chain rule, it will be sum of i is equal to 1 to the number of n is the, uh, let me write somewhere, the number of bodies were capital N. So, number of configuration coordinates was thrice n, number of holonomic constants were h this is 
or small n the number of new coordinates that we need hmm. and that is what we are writing in terms of that 1 to small n huh? and then it will be partial derivative of r uh, j delta q i q dot i plus delta r j okay chain rule fine okay uh, we will stop here and then we will continue with this in the next class